Welcome to the Tuesday edition of Wine's World. I'm sorry I've been away for a while. I've been kind of busy with a bunch of things. Um, and one of them is paying bills. <laughs> and, and that's kind of my topic today, although I'm going to talk more generally about um, being in debt. And I can't really speak to um, the whole population of the world or of any of the countries that I've lived in or whatever. I just want to talk about my experience because I expect it touches on the experience of a lot of other people. So let's get into it. See, now I'm well retired, um, which is to say I'm still working a lot, but I don't have a job. And that in itself is a very interesting concept here in Cambodia. In Cambodia, they will say something like, he is a farmer, he does not have a job. Well, what that means in Khmer is that he is working for himself. That to have a job means that you're working for somebody else. And I'm certainly not working for somebody else. So in that sense, in the Khmer sense, you can say that I don't have a job. But I do publish a lot. And um, I, <laughs> occasionally I make money. Not always. A lot of the time nowadays I actually pay publishers to put my uh, books uh, online for free as open access so that people can read them without having to pay for them. So I don't get any money, you know, it's the opposite. I pay for them to go there. But they're, they're no less um, valuable, I hope. It's just that I don't, I don't need any more money. And that's, that's what I'm trying to get to. The, see, the fact is that for almost all of my working life, in fact, I'm going to say pretty much all of it, I was broke and in, in debt. Uh, I had credit cards and I had credit card debts that I would sometimes just barely pay off the minimum to. So I was, um, you know, let's say carrying a balance of $2,000 and maybe the monthly payment was something like $100. And most of that would just be interest. So I'm paying off any of the balance. Um, and back in the old, old days, I'm mean, talking about really old days, days when um, I was when I first started working as a professor at the SUNY system, I used to have to um, take a check home. Uh, I think it was Wednesdays, uh, the first Wednesday in each month when you go to the secretary of your department and she'd have a big bundle of checks for all the people in the department and you get your check, take it home and put it in the bank. Well, fortunately, very early on, they went to direct deposit. And that meant that on Wednesday at uh, opening a business, my money was in the bank. Now there's a whole other set of principles here that I don't want to get into right now, but I may at some point, of like where value or, or wealth actually exists when you live in a system that is all electronic. You know, like I worked for a month and at the end of the month, or the beginning of the next month, um, my balance in my bank account went up. <laughs> No, it's all just numbers. I mean, like, there's no money change. Like, not even a check. Not even a physical check that I paid. Uh, even though the check is 
just a, like in a certain sense a worthless piece of paper. Well a hundred dollar bill is also a worthless piece of paper unless you have faith in it. But at least it's a piece of paper that you can hold on to and you can give to somebody and they can give you something in exchange um, for that and maybe also give you some, some money back. But when it's just a matter of an electronic pulse going from Albany, which is where I was paid from, to my bank in um, Port Jervis, which is where I, I, I took the money out. Um, nothing was changing here, it was just electronic pulses. But anyway, we'll, 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 we'll not talk about that right now, we'll just talk about direct deposit. So I very rarely had any money left at the end of the month in my bank account. But the day before, um, I could go to the, um, the supermarket, I think it was a Grand Union, I don't remember, um, something like that. Um, I could go to the, to the uh, supermarket after the banks had closed on Tuesday before I got paid on Wednesday and I could write them a check. You know, I could buy a lot of groceries, go in, they knew me, they would take my check without um, needing for identification and they would pay the check in the next day because the bank was closed or at minimum what they would do is they take the, all the checks and their money in a, in a sack and put them in the night deposit box um, but the bank employees wouldn't come until the next day and take it out and so my check would not clear until Wednesday even though I had paid it on Tuesday. Um, it's what's known as kiting a check and it's not legal <laughs> but nobody really cares because by the time the check was paid in I had money in the account. So the day before I was paid, I could, I could eat. <laughs> now there's sometimes when I was really, really broke, there were a lot of times, I mean, I wouldn't say like all the time, but there were quite a few times when I had to go around my campus and pick up um, cans and bottles um, that had deposits on them. They're usually like five cents or 10 cents deposit. And I'd have to collect enough to be able to pay my toll to get home <laughs> on a toll road. <laughs> That's how broke I was. And I'm talking about from the time I was 30 until I was close to 60. So easily, like easily 30 years. I was earning, you know, an okay salary. When I first started working, my annual salary was 15,000 a year. Well, that was 1979 when I began and it would go up, you know, little bits at a time, you know, 5% increase because um, of, you know, various negotiated raises and so forth. And so when I finally retired, when I was 58 years old, I was earning about 85,000 a year, which coupled with inflation and everything else, was not much better than the 15,000 that I earned when I first started working. When I first started working, I had a free apartment on campus. So I, I did have to pay taxes, it's true, but I didn't have to pay any rent. Um, I, you know, I had enough to, to be able to eat fairly well and so forth, but um, I, didn't, I didn't have much to be able to do. Any, I mean, I had a very, very beaten up old car. I think I paid about $2,000 for it, something like that. It was a 1968 Plymouth Barracuda with, I, I don't know, 200,000 miles on it or something like that. It, it was okay, but um, <laughs> it was the best I could afford. And you know, incrementally, you know, I got better cars. Um, I eventually moved off campus uh, and a year later I bought a house. But in order to buy a house that I could afford, I had to live two hours commute away from the campus where I worked. So during term time, three days, usually three days a week, 
um, sometimes four, but mostly three days a week. I had a four-hour commute. That's two hours there, two hours back. And some days I started work at eight in the morning, or no, so nine in the morning. That's, they didn't have eight o'clock classes. <laughs> nine o'clock. So I have a nine o'clock class, and my last class finished at ten at night. So I had to either leave the house before seven o'clock. Some, usually more like six o'clock because I wanted to beat the traffic and I wouldn't get home until midnight and of course I have to pay for the cars, I have to pay for upkeep, I have to pay for um, petrol, you know, oil and maintenance, tires and all that kind of thing, insurance um, and then when my wife um, started working she needed a car so we had to buy a second car and all of that, and buy a house with a mortgage, and and then pay for heating and um, electricity, um, cable, and then as things you know got more sophisticated, um, internet, <laughs> and on and on and on. So until I retired, I was broke. I was in debt, so it just, just like your typical, you know, hamster on a wheel. You know, I was, I was commuting to work to make money, to pay for, the ability to commute to work, <laughs> and and of course also live. But but I wasn't I wasn't doing anything extra. You know, if I wanted to do something like travel abroad or even do field work abroad, I either had to get a grant, which was quite difficult to do, or I had to do something like teach summer school, which I normally did. And I would teach what were called intensive courses. That is, a, um, a three credit course has to meet for three hours um, a week for 15 weeks. and. That can be done in a number of ways. You can have a three-hour class once a week for, for a 15-week semester. You can have an hour and a half class twice a week for 15 weeks. Um, we never did this, but at some universities you can have an hour class three times a week uh, for 15 weeks. I, I used to do that when I taught at the University of North Carolina, but we didn't do that at, um, at my SUNY school. But I often taught, um, like let's say, two classes of an hour and a half, uh, twice a week, and then one, three hours. So on Tuesdays I would teach two classes. Like typically one would be at, at nine o'clock uh, for an hour and a half, and then another one would be, um, uh, yeah, maybe um, could be eleven o'clock, or could be later. It could be something like one o'clock. And then one at seven o'clock in the evening until midnight, uh, till ten, and then home at midnight. And it just felt like I was on a treadmill. <laughs> you know, I was making money in order to um, pay for making money. And it wasn't until I retired and and first moved to Argentina, and then started traveling around the different parts of the world that I actually caught up. And the way I did it, <laughs> it's sort of like absurdly simple. I sold my house, I sold all my cars, but well, I didn't sell all of them, I, I kept one of them because my, my son needed a car. But when he graduated and moved away from the United States and I could sell his, well it was actually my car that he'd taken over, sell that car, sell the house, and um, I also had a, a a fairly substantial lump sum that came from um, my retirement, but that all went to paying off my debts. You know, so like I'd, I'd worked for 30 years in order to make a big lump sum in order to pay off the debts that I had accumulated whilst working to <laughs> to, to do my job, and and so all of that went. But I but. But then what I started doing was um, teaching, 
um, just to keep body and soul together. Uh, I um, taught in China, in Italy, in um, um, Myanmar for a total of about eight years, I think. And I started to make money. And the way I started to make money was that I didn't have a car or cars. Uh, so I didn't have to pay for all of their upkeep and insurance and all of that. I didn't have a house. I p paid rent. And surprisingly, in just about all of those places, China, yeah, Italy, um, Myanmar, and now Cambodia, where I live, all very cheap to, to rent a small, like, one bedroom or studio apartment. Uh, and so, like now, for example, um, my combined costs, now we're talking about rent, utilities, food, um, transportation, which I'll talk about in a second, and you know, other things, entertainment, whatever, comes to about $600 a month. <laughs> That's it. And I have a stable retirement income of close to $3,000 a month. So in retirement, I'm not in debt. I mean, not, I'm not fabulously wealthy, but if I want something, if I, if I see a nice camera that I want to buy, and it, 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 you know, it's going to cost a few thousand dollars, or, or, or let's say just a lens, or some such thing. I don't have to think about it. I, I can afford it. I'm, I'm not, you know, like prodigal. I don't go out of my way to, to buy everything I can possibly think of, because at some point I'm going to move again. I've been in Cambodia now for nearly eight years which is a very long time, and no, I, my whole idea was to spend two years in one place and move on. And I did that in China, I did it in Italy, um, a little shorter in, in Myanmar. Uh, and then when I got to Cambodia, I was going to move again, and it COVID hit. And so I kind of settled in for the long haul, and I got involved with university teaching and research, and, and I started publishing. And amazingly, I've got like so many books that have, have, have come out and I've got contracts on them. So I can't really move. But I don't want to just, you know, accumulate stuff. So I don't spend a lot of time in, in stores shopping. But if I want a particular item for my work or, or for pleasure or whatever, I buy it. And I could never do that when I was working. <laughs> it's in retirement that I can do it. But here's the trick. You have to move to a place you can afford. You see, I can't do this on my, on my retirement salary in the United States or in the United Kingdom. I could do it in Argentina, but I don't really want to move to Argentina until um, <laughs> I'm, I'm starting to drool at the mouth and, and uh, sleep all day. Um, because it's a long way from anywhere, you know. I, like right now, if I want to, I can get on a plane and fly pretty much anywhere. And before COVID, I did. I mean, there was one year, can't remember which one it was, I think it was 2018, when I ended up almost filling up my passport, I took a total of, I, I, I think it was 24 flights in 10 different countries. And I can afford that. Uh, you know, I can do it now um, once I get my passport back from <laughs> from the passport office because I had to have it replaced because I'd filled it up. Um, and it just makes me like look back and and ask myself, what was all that middle passage about? Like right now, I can do what I want. I can buy what I want, I can go where I want, anytime I want, pretty much. Um, but I'm 73 years old. I would be much happier if I could have done that when I was 43 years old, or 53 even. Um, but, but I'm not really up to all the, 
uh, gallivanting about that I used to. I, you know, I like to sit at home and, and do my writing. Um, and occasionally, you know, I'll, I'll go out and, and be with people and so forth. But, but that's the, there's a strange inversion of li the life of debt, let's, let's call it that. That you spend all your life, or I spent all of my life in debt, and just struggling to get by, struggling to pay the rent and to get the heat on. And now, <laughs> I don't have to worry, but why is it inverted like that? Why, why couldn't it be the other way around? Why couldn't it be that, you know, that I have to pinch pennies now that I'm old and can't do much? <laughs> you know, because it'd be all right. I, you know, I wouldn't worry. It, you know, I mean, in fact, I do kind of pinch pennies in a way, but not out of duty, out of <laughs> sort of out of cussed habit. Anyway, that's my talk about debt for today. I hope you are debt free yourself, and I hope you have a good day and a good week. And I'll see you on Friday, maybe with a recipe. I'm not sure. So, be well.